Well, again, thank you for having me. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm the Director of Forestry for the Northwest Natural Resource Group. I've been working with the organization for about 20 years now. And my organization is dedicated to researching and implementing principles of ecological forestry in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I've been a consulting forester for over 25 years, and I'm also a member of a three-generation tree farming family that owns over 200 acres of forest land up here in Washington, uh, where I live. Um, so I tend to go from practicing forestry during the week to practicing forestry during the weekends. Uh, it's a rather chronic merger of both my vocation and, and avocation. Um, so I speak a lot to mixed audiences who invariably and understandably have mixed reactions to the message I carry regarding forest management. So I wanna start this conversation by stating very specifically how I define ecological forestry and where I feel its principles are best applied. Uh, my use of the term ecological forestry refers to the observation of natural forest developmental processes and how we can emulate those processes to the extent possible in the management of our forests to improve their ecological functions and their resilience. So the purpose of this presentation is to lay out a thought process and to provide forest management options specifically for forest owners and managers who are interested in improving the ecological functions of their forests. The types of forest owners who I, I most often work with and therefore who likely will be most interested in uh, these principles of ecological forestry are conservation groups, uh, land trusts, uh, small woodland owners or family forests, uh, forest owners much like myself, uh, public agencies and tribes. Uh, although the principles of ecological forestry can also be woven into the practice of industrial forestry and often are when protecting streams and wetlands and steep slopes and habitat for rare threatened endangered species, uh, et cetera, uh, industrial forestry is, is designed for the very specific purpose of maximizing the production of wood fiber and net present value to shareholders. So if your primary objective is timber production, then the agronomic model of plantation forestry, sometimes referred to as tree farming, is where it's at. So to be very clear, I'm not here to tell you that ecological forestry is a viable alternative to, or even can compete uh, with the short-term productive capacity of plantation tree farms. Given domestic and global demand for wood products, there will always be a need for industrial production of trees, much like there's a need for the industrial production of agricultural crops uh, to feed our growing population. So I'm not here to cast dispersions on industrial forestry. Our society needs it, okay? I'm here to share instead forest management alternatives for forest owners who are interested in providing a broader range of ecosystem services and public benefits. And I'm also here to advocate for the expansion of ecological forestry practices to restore older forest habitat that due to the conversion of our region's primary forest to other uses uh, is now a vastly underrepresented ecosystem on our landscape. And with the loss of those older forests has gone a unique suite of ecological functions that younger forests can't provide. So that being said, I also want to address the, the, the somewhat misnomer of the title of my presentation um, that I gave uh, when we, we set this up with, uh, when I set this up with Tom, uh, this ain't your grandfather's forestry. So uh, to be frank, when I was asked to speak on this topic a few months ago and, and set up this original presentation, uh, I was asked for a title and I didn't have one in mind. So I hastily threw out a title that was very similar uh, to a presentation given by our executive director, Seth Zuckerman, at the Ignite Seattle conference in 2018, not your father's lumberjacks, uh, although his presentation was on modern logging equipment and its application in ecologically based timber harvesting. So my title fit though, as there is an entirely different and constantly renewing body of science that is driving the practice of modern day ecological forestry but the title isn't entirely appropriate either because regardless of the science, we are in practice 
implementing forest management strategies that have been used by old farmers, generations of forest owners, and when you get down to the principal level of the practice, really by humans for millennia. So that title, this ain't your grandfather's forestry, also quickly became an ironic title for me because everything that I originally learned about the ethic and practice of good forest stewardship came from my father, the grandfather of my kids, whose wisdom is now trickling down to their generation. So my family owned 80 acres of forest land in the St. Croix River Valley, a couple hours north of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And over the course of the first 20 years of my life, my family frequently traveled to the land, as we called it, and tinkered with various forestry activities. We cut enough firewood to heat our house all winter. We tapped sugar maples and made maple syrup. We took spring water home for drinking. Uh, not being hunters ourselves, my dad leased the annual hunter rights to our property for the value of the annual land taxes. We cross-country skied, we hiked, we camped, we picnicked, we played, and we developed an awe and an appreciation for nature. Later, my dad took oak logs to a local sawmill and had them turned into lumber, from which he made various items, including this set of heirloom quality craftsman style living room furniture for my family. So my parents were of the Eldo Leopold School of Conservation. If you're a careful steward of the land, the land will support you. Throughout their entire tenure on that land, my parents planted white pine beneath the hardwood dominant forest canopy. Now, white pine was the original old growth across much of the Midwest before a couple brothers from Wisconsin by the last name of Weyerhaeuser started a timber company and began logging their way west. Uh, before my parents sold a conservation easement to their land uh, or on their land to the Minnesota Land Trust and eventually the land altogether to another private owner, the crowns of the white pine had just begun emerging through the canopy of hardwoods. Now, a key tenet of ecological forestry is that when we manage for for manage forests for biodiversity, we're provided more with more diverse opportunities for goods and ecosystem services. So the story of Ma and Pa Hansen is really a story of ecological entrepreneurialism. They recognized the wide range of values in a forest and sought to utilize many of them. Now, I'm a consulting forester by profession. And when I tell people that I'm a forester, I, I often get kind of a puzzled reaction. So apparently fewer and fewer people realize there's a profession of managing, not just logging forests. So I work with people who own or manage forest land on all different scales from five acres to over 100,000 acres and help them decide how to manage their forests to meet their objectives. And that's always the first place that I start. What are your objectives? So adding to this list of broad object objectives that my parents manage for are other common object objectives uh, that folks express to me these days. Uh, carbon sequestration commercial timber production, flood mitigation, et cetera. And as you get into the practice of forest management, you quickly begin to learn that you can't optimize all of these goals simultaneously. Some of these goals are just incompatible with others. Regardless of how diverse a forest may be, it can't provide for 100% of our needs everywhere all the time. Now, I'm often approached by forest owners who tell me that they want to optimize carbon sequestration, wildlife habitat, biodiversity, fire resilience, climate adaptation, et cetera. Now, those all sound like laudable goals, right? But these clients are often disappointed and wonder if they've hired the wrong guy when I say, I can't do that for them. I can't optimize all of those values as some of them are incompatible with each other in either the short or long-term or both. So there have to be trade-offs. So the first principle of forest management you have to learn is to compromise. However, a lot of these goals are compatible or compatible to a lesser or greater degree. And if we prioritize them, we can develop silvicultural systems that emphasize a range of goals. So that's the frontispiece to my presentation. It kind of sets the stage for the rest of what I'm gonna share with you this evening. And here's where I wanna go from here. I will provide an overview of forest ecology in the Pacific Northwest. 
Uh, I want to summarize the ecosystem services forests, in particular older forests provide. I want to make an argument for actively managing our forests uh, in a manner, excuse me, that emulates uh, old forest structure and functions versus taking solely a passive approach to achieving conservation objectives. I will talk about climate change and how it may affect the forests in our region. Then I will give you an overview of specific forest management strategies that we can use that emulate natural forest development processes and are intended to restore ecosystem services while providing other societal needs such as jobs, revenue, valuable forest products, et cetera. Um, and then, excuse me, if we have enough time at the end, I'll close with a short video on the Nisqually Community Forest that expresses the forest management philosophy uh, that I've just covered this evening. So first I wanna give you a primer on how forests in our region develop. So, some basic principles of ecology that shape forest composition and some key structural and functional characteristics of natural forests. So we have a baseline to work from when we begin talking about how nature can serve as a model for active forest management. All forests are born from disturbance. A young forest begins its journey to old growth on a site that was disturbed from its prior condition. There are many natural disturbance events that will either reset a site back to zero or alter the conditions of the site enough to stimulate the natural regeneration of a new cohort of trees. So Mount St. Helens may be the most dramatic example where the forest within the blast zone will really, literally reset to zero. Now a wind disturbance or ice storm is a more moderate example as not all of the trees are blown down. Uh, a lot of legacy structures such as both live and dead trees remain along with a lot of down dead wood that feeds an elaborate nutrient system. So along with a heterogeneous distribution of trees that endure natural disturbance events, there are also often a myriad number and species of tree seedlings in the understory that combined set the stage for the next generation of forests, depending on the nature of this disturbance. So common natural disturbance events include fire, wind storms, ice storms, landslides, disease, insects, drought. Uh, certainly another common disturbance regime is humans with land clearing for ag agriculture or development, uh, logging, et cetera. So from any of these disturbance events begins a chain of sequences referred to as natural succession. Often natural succession begins with a site becoming rapidly colonized by pioneer species, such as red alder on wetter soils or Douglas fir on drier soils. Uh, these species tend to seed into a disturbed site at a high density, aggressively outcompete most other species and typically form a monocultural stand of trees. Now, eventually the dense seedlings close canopy and the developing stand enters what is called the competitive exclusion phase as individual trees compete with each other for increasingly limited resources such as sunlight uh, and soil moisture. Through the gold fashion process of natural selection, some trees achieve dominance over others and the less dominant trees eventually succumb to suppression mortality as they fail to adequately compete for limited resources. Now, take a look at this diagram that shows the relationship of trees to one another in the canopy. As competition occurs between the trees, some trees achieve dominance, D. Some trees are slightly less dominant or co-dominant, C. Some trees start becoming subordinate in the stand or achieve an intermediate position in the canopy, I. And some trees become suppressed beneath the closing canopy of the forest, S. Uh, eventually, these latter trees may succumb to suppression mortality, M. So many stands can remain in this competitive phase for decades, for even well over 100 years, before they gradually thin themselves out and create opportunities for other plant species, trees and shrubs, uh, to enter the stand. Now, given enough time and the absence of additional disturbance events, these formerly homogeneous stands will gradually succeed to increasing species and structural diversity as trees continue to succumb to suppression mortality or other mortality agents such as disease and storm damage they convert to increasingly larger snags dead trees 
that provide habitat for well over 100 species of wildlife. As trees fall on the forest, they add increasingly larger down logs to the forest floor that also provide habitat for over 400 species of insects, which in turn support an elaborate food chain. Now, as gaps form in the forest canopy due to disease or windstorms, they create opportunities for other species of trees and shrubs to enter the forest. Uh, in areas where the canopy remains dense, uh, more shade tolerant trees, such as western red cedar or western hemlock, may establish themselves and begin their long journey to eventually eclipse the dominant but less shade tolerant Douglas fir. Now, at a broad, broad excuse me, landscape level, a region can be divided into different forest zones or vegetation zones based on which tree species eventually achieves dominance. Now, two forest ecologists at the uh, Oregon State University, Jerry Franklin and C.T. Dernis, in the 1970s, created a system of broad vegetation types that is still used today. Most of Western Oregon and Washington, for instance, is considered to be in the Western Hemlock for Forest Zone. This means that if given no other major stand replacing event, Western Hemlock will eventually achieve dominance and become the climax species on most sites. This is largely due to its shade tolerance and that it gradually succeeds the less shade tolerant Douglas fir. So within these broad forest zones or subzones, such as the Puget Lowland Douglas fir zone that occurs primarily on droughty glacial soils, or the Sitka spruce zone along the coast, or the silver fir zone above 3,000 feet, that is an outcome of elevation, rainfall, and temperature. In these microclimates, there are specific influencing factors that contribute to other species than Western hemlock eventually achieving dominance. Now, we are becoming increasingly aware of the value of the ecological services, the ecosystem services that complex forest ecosystems provide. As we weigh the logistics and costs of addressing some of these ecological problems we face, such as flood mitigation, climate change, endangered species, and wildfires, we are beginning to realize that restoring the ability of nature to resolve these problems is not only less expensive and more effective than engineering solutions, but provides a broader range of co-benefits. So let's also take a moment and look at the ecological significance of older forests as their performance metrics are singularly unique compared to the younger forests they've been replaced with. Let's start with carbon. Old growth forests store nearly four times the volume of carbon than younger plantations do and stored in a manner that is more resilient to disturbance and, and loss than younger forests. Habitat. Older forests contain a higher volume of critical habitat structures, such as large snags and down logs, as well as habitat features that are important to rare, threatened, and endangered species. Primary forests contain an average of 90 snags and 90 down logs per acre, whereas younger third or fourth generation plantations may contain none. When we begin the, I'm sorry, when we began the, the forest management planning process for the Nisqually Community Forest up near Ashford, Washington, we worked with the EPA to model changes to watershed hydrology using different forest management scenarios. One of the outcomes of this modeling exercise was the revelation that forests older than 60 to 80 years have the capacity to retain more water higher in the watershed longer into the summer and can increase summer stream flow by more than three times the volume of younger forests. Now, this is primarily due to the high transpiration rate of young, rapidly growing forests. Now, this was a critical finding for us at the community, as the community forest sits at the headwaters of the Mayshell watershed, a stream and river system that supports an endangered population of steelhead that rely on cool summer stream flow for their survival. Biodiversity. Old growth forests contain significantly more biodiversity than young, highly simplified plantations. And we are still discovering new species that occupy the camp complex structure of older forests, from epiphytes in the canopy to biota in the soil. Timber production. On average, given the soils and climate of the Pacific Northwest, forests are capable of producing about 800 board feet of timber per acre per year on a sustained basis 
once they reach 50, 60 years old. So by way of comparison, it takes approximately 20,000 board feet to build an average 1,400 to 1,600 square foot home. So every 25 acres of maturing forest is capable of producing enough lumber for a home just by skimming the interest, the annual growth off the top, not even touching the principal. So at today's log values, this represents about $16,000 of gross log value that can be generated from these 25 acres every year, not to mention the added value of jobs as these logs are processed into usable materials. So not surprisingly, more and more people have been coming to my organization asking, how do we restore old growth forests and all the values that they provide? In fact, based on this overwhelming interest, we hosted a workshop a few years ago titled, How to Grow Your Own Old Growth in 300 Years or Less. And it was our most popular workshop ever. So although there are some features of old growth forests that just require time, there are active manage management strategies we can apply to younger forests that, it, that accelerate uh, development of old growth forest characteristics and functions in a much shorter time. Utilizing management strategies that emulate natural disturbance and stand development processes is therefore, I believe, the practice of ecological forestry. So that's the prelude to my presentation. Uh, I now want to start talking about actual forest management, management because this is where I think it gets really fun. So the very first premise we need to start with is that there are too many damn trees out there. Think about that. We have converted 95% of the original old growth forests across the Pacific Northwest to other uses, primarily to plantations stocked with trees at a very high density. So a friend recently sent me this tagline that followed the signature in an email she received from an individual who works for a timber company. And aside from the advocacy of wanton wastefulness, the claim that we have more trees in the US today than we did 100 years ago is incredibly misleading. Converting a modestly stocked old growth forest to a highly stocked plant plantation may net you more trees per acre, but there really are few other ecological equivalencies. So let's assume then that our objective is to restore older forest structure and functions to the younger forests that we are currently working with. Our single most effective tool to achieve this objective is thinning, and in fact, using multiple thinnings over time. Why? Let me give you a scenario that will help put this uh, into perspective. When I hike in old growth forests across the Northwest, regardless of if they're coastal, in the Olympic Mountains, the Cascade Range, I often find that the stocking density of the very large dominant trees averages something between 50 and 100 trees per acre. That's just considering the large canopy trees. There are maybe any uh, you know, innumerable understory trees and seedlings uh, beneath the, uh, these dominant trees. But when most people visualize old growth forests, they think of the big ones, and they account for around 50 to 100 trees per acre. Now, there's always going to be some variation to this. And we are talking about complex heterogeneous ecosystems that are shaped by highly localized microclimatic natural disturbance regimes. Uh, but let's stick with this metric. So these 50 to 100 trees per acre represent the carrying capacity for a site. A carrying capacity refers to the ability of an ecosystem to support a given population of a particular organism. So if we're starting with a plantation or even a naturally regenerated forest, then we're likely starting with a forest that has more than 300 to 400 trees per acre. So it should be immediately logical that we have two pathways to get to our desired future condition. One, we let nature run its course. Let the stand self thin through the competitive exclusion phase that I described earlier and gradually succeed to older forest structure and functions. Or two, we thin to accelerate the process. So I'm asked by many conservation groups why can't we just lock the gates and let nature run its course? And my response is, well, you certainly can. You know, I think it's a perfectly legitimate option in some locations, but there are also consequences to doing nothing, the outcomes of which may be in conflict with some of our objectives. 
Specifically, highly stocked stands often lack resilience and are highly susceptible to disturbance. So let me give you some reasons why. Trees that grow in competition with one another achieve a high height to diameter ratio as they compete for sunlight that makes them very susceptible to breakage during wind and ice storms, as well as at a stand level, highly susceptible to large scale blowdown. High stocking densities often result in highly stressed trees as they are all competing for increasingly limited resources. Highly stressed trees are more susceptible to insects and diseases. And if the limiting resource is water, highly stocked stands are also much more prone to drought induced mortality. Highly stocked stands accumulate large amounts of dead biomass and the simplified stand structure comprised of smaller diameter trees is highly susceptible to forest fires. Highly stocked and homogeneous stands provide very simplified habitat features and have reduced value to wildlife. And lastly, highly stocked stands result in very slow growing trees, which delays the ability of the forest to produce merchantable timber products and may result in overall lower value timber. So I think this is a good moment to make an aside about carbon sequestration as increasingly people are asking me, how can we optimize forests for carbon? First of all, to be perfectly honest, if our sole objective is to maximize the ability of a forest to sequester and store carbon, then the best management strategy is to do nothing. Forests in the Northwest, and this is presumably true elsewhere, will optimize photosynthetic leaf surface area, which drives primary production of biomass, and remain in a near optimal biomass accumulation phase for many decades, if not centuries, until the ecosystem reaches a steady state equilibrium between biomass accumulation and decay. So even though individual tree growth will slow down in an overstocked and highly competitive forest, at the stand level, there is still rapid biomass accumulation occurring. As suppressed trees succumb to mortality, live biomass gets converted to dead biomass. But from a carbon standpoint, there is still a net positive accumulation occurring across both live and dead pools of carbon in a forest. Now, recently we conducted a thought exercise to compare the differences in carbon sequestration in the same forest managed under four different silvicultural regimes over a 160 year period of time. We started with a Douglas fir plantation planted in 1980 at a standard density of 350 trees per acre. And the silvicultural regimes that we modeled included clear cutting every 40 years, uh, extended rotation or clear cutting on 80 year cycles, uh, thinning every 20 years, and then lastly, no management. And we used an open source uh, forest growth model developed by the US Forest Service called the Forest Vegetation Simulator, or FVS, to run the scenarios. Now, this model takes into consideration the dynamics of carbon in several different pools, uh, forest, forest products, and landfills, and assigns both growth and de uh, decay rates to each. Now, as per this graph, quite demonstrably, the no management scenario shows superior results in carbon sequestration. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, the business as usual 40 year rotation pathway performed the worst as a lot of carbon gets lost during the logging and manufacturing process. And a lot of carbon also quickly ends up in landfills where it becomes a carbon source again. Uh, extended rotation and thinning perform considerably better as more carbon remains in the forest uh, and there are less opportunities for consistent losses uh, primarily throughout the logging and, and manufacturing process. Um, as an advocate of active forest management now, I find it particularly noteworthy that the total carbon sequestra sequestration rate under a thin only regime was not too far off from the no management. And this is partly due to keeping a forest in near optimal growth phase while consistently converting some portion of the timber to long live forest products. Now, the wild card in this whole modeling exercise is that FVS cannot predict and therefore model the effects of natural disturbance. So therefore the superior results of, no, of the no management uh, scenario, I would say are somewhat dubious. If we can absolutely guarantee that this forest will not be adversely affected by any type of natural disturbance, 
then arguably the right course of action is to do nothing and just let it grow. However, as I like to say, if you wanna know how to make nature laugh, tell her your plans. With the assumption that natural disturbance happens, and given the fact that we likely have more objectives than solely carbon sequestration, then we're back to the justification for active management, thinning. And our goal should be to manage for resilience, in particular relative to climate change, so we can help ensure the forests in our region can sequester and store carbon for the long term. So I promised to start talking about forest management, but I just provided my own segue to talk about climate change for a moment uh, and its effects on Northwest forests. So we have to get this in summer because, you know, climate change, we just don't seem to be able to avoid it. So my organization hosted a series of seminars a few years ago on the topic of climate adaptation for Northwest forests and published a guidebook for forest managers. The, the guidebook and all of the presentations are on our website. Uh, they're a tremendous body of useful information. Uh, during her overview presentation on climate change in the Northwest, uh, Jessica Holofsky, a climate research scientist with the Washington DNR presented this slide. Now, I interpret this slide like this. If we get our shit together as a global community and enact meaningful measures to combat carbon emissions, then average temper temperatures in the Northwest will still go up and anticipated two to five degrees over the next 80 years. If we don't get our shit together, then temps may increase as much as five to 13 degrees. Under this latter business as usual scenario, this translates to the Puget Sound where I live experiencing similar temp temperatures as Sacramento, California. Think about that. Now, I like Sacramento, but I'd rather visit there than have it come here. So the overall prediction for rainfall is that the Northwest will likely continue to receive the same annual amount, but it will be even more concentrated during winter months with longer, drier summers. Weather events will become more extreme, which directly translates to more severe weather-driven disturbance events. Warming temperatures may trigger insect outbreaks, uh, may make new diseases viable in our forests, and could, this, could set the stage for more frequent, larger-scale forest fires. Now, it's quite possible that we're already beginning to see the impacts of climate change in our forests. I've personally noticed a dramatic increase in tree mortality across the Northwest, in particular amongst the least drought tolerant species such as Western hemlock, grand fir, and Western red cedar. Uh, the forests in British Columbia just endured a 20 year epidemic pine beetle outbreak that ravaged hundreds of thousands of hectares. We've endured several recent years of record or near record wildfire burns. So it's highly likely that climate change is exacerbating these occurrences but I would also caution you not to point the finger entirely at climate change. Remember, our forests are in a highly disturbed condition due to a history of past management that has resulted in them currently being stocked at a very high density compared to the long-term carrying capacity of the site. So for tree species that can take hundreds of years to develop to maturity, there are very few forests in the Northwest that have even achieved 100 years of age since first being cut and are, biologically speaking, still in a relatively early successional stage. So a lot of the mortality we're currently seeing in our forests may therefore very well be the outcome of the natural process of self-thinning and species adjustment. And we are essentially finding ourselves in the middle of the competitive mortality phase of forest development. Now, this doesn't mean we can just breathe a deep sigh of relief and say, oh, don't worry, Mother Nature has it covered. Remember that these early stages of forest recovery can also make forests more vulnerable or prone to disturbance, in particular fire. Now, we often live in forested landscapes. We want a sustainable provision of forest products and ecosystem services. We don't want to see our forests endure a catastrophe. So I was invited recently to Bainbridge Island to work with the land trust there to assess their forests and make management recommendations. Uh, over recent years, they were seeing a rapid increase in tree mortality, in particular cedar, across many of their forests, and they were becoming increasingly concerned about the health of forests in general across the island. Now, Bainbridge Island is essentially a large glacial moraine left behind by the Vashon Glacier when it retreated approximately 14,000 years ago. 
most, if not all, of the primary forests on that island were cut by the 1920s to feed the mill at Port Blakely, once the largest lumber mill in the world. Replanting laws weren't required until the 1940s in Washington. So most of the current forests on the island are comprised of a dense hodgepodge of naturally regenerated conifers and hardwoods. Now, one of nature's strategies for colonizing a site is to throw a lot of seed at it from a lot of different plants. What happens then is you get a broad mix of species, all of which may not necessarily be suitable for the site in the long term. For instance, Western red cedar, grand fir, Western hemlock, are not particularly drought tolerant trees. The fact that we're seeing an increase in mortality amongst these species on droughty glacially derived soils may have more to do with their unsuitability for the site and the forest stands in which they occur are going through a natural process of selective thinning as the less drought tolerant trees gradually fade from the forest, I'm sorry, gradually fade from the most droughty sites and are replaced by more drought tolerant species such as Douglas fir, pine, Pacific Madrone, maple, and oak. However, this self-thinning process is contributing a lot of dead wood and a lot of dry wood to a historically fire-prone ecosystem that people now occupy at a high density. Okay, so I finally want to transition to talking about the art and science of applied ecological forestry. So thank you for bearing with me here. Now, I distill the practice of ecological forestry into two fundamental uh, principles, right tree for the right location and stocking density, how many trees there are in a given area. We must think very carefully uh, about the long, excuse me, uh, we must think very carefully about the long-term viability of tree species for a particular site. Uh, as our climate changes, some sites may get wetter, some sites may get drier, some sites may get shadier, some sites may be more exposed. Like any organism, trees have a range of preferences relative to soil type, moisture, and sunlight, and a range of tolerance. What we're likely seeing now is the range of tolerance for all trees shrinking. So we must be also conscious of how many trees there are and of what species. Uh, by recognizing both compatibilities and competition between trees, we can begin to understand what happens with forests at various stocking levels. So if we can agree on four things. One, uh, most of our forests are in, are in a disturbed condition relative to their historic norm. Two, uh, most of our forests are overstocked relative to the long-term carrying capacity of the site. Three, the future climate regime will be different from the past and may support even fewer trees per acre. Uh, and four, doing nothing may incur increasing risks for mo most forests, then it should stand to reason that one of the best strategies for improving the condition of our forests is thinning, the selective cutting of specific trees. How we go about doing that is, I believe, the central practice of ecological forestry. Now, regardless of what our objectives may be, I think every forest owner or manager will say that they want a healthy forest. However, forest health quickly becomes a specious word as it is commonly, or as it commonly has anthropogenic connotations. Uh, for instance, we often define forest health in terms of factors that either limit or enhance the ability of a forest to provide what humans want, such as timber. I prefer to use the word resilience. In terms of forest ecosystems, resilience refers to the ability to adapt to and recover from disturbance, in particular now climate change. So the goal of ecological forestry then is to manage forests that are resilient and productive. So if we can accept the argument that thousands of years of successional development has led to forest ecosystems that are both productive and resilient to disturbance, then I believe that one of the most instructive models we can have for how to manage our forests are the effects of natural disturbance regimes. And we should design a system of silviculture that emulates to the ex extent possible those effects. In my way of thinking, the basic elements of ecological forestry are therefore to mimic natural forest processes, to improve forest structural diversity and biodiversity, to increase ecological capital and ecosystem services, 
uh, to restore ecological resilience, to diversify financial values, and lastly, to increase aesthetics, because you know who doesn't love a beautiful forest? So I want to conclude by taking you back through the successional processes of a forest from disturbance to development of late serial or old growth characteristics and functions, but with the addition of active management, so you can see the application of various principles of ecological forestry. Uh, I'm also going to share some very basic forest management costs and revenue projections. Now, these are highly generalized, uh, so solely are valuable in showing trends and should not be taken literally, the, the costs and the, the revenue they provide. So let's start with, again, uh, the very initial stages uh, of a forest developing itself, what we refer to as stand initiation. Uh, in this case, rather than allowing a site to naturally regenerate, you know, we are going to come in and intentionally plant that site. So the purpose is to rapidly colonize the site and optimize the photosynthetic capacity to produce biomass for timber and carbon sequestration. By planting it, we can use appropriate species for the site and for our goals. Now, we're likely going to plant a site at around 400 trees per acre. Again, that's a standard reforestation stocking density. Uh, the cost of doing this is around 400 to 600 trees per acre, although that highly depends on site preparation costs. Uh, so from a graphic representation standpoint, we have the newly established stand on the left. And this is representative of a, of a 20th acre plot. Uh, on the right, then, is our desired future condition, the 50 trees per acre, assuming, again, what we're doing is ultimately managing uh, for older forests that emulate uh, old growth functions and structure. So one climate adaptation strategy that's gaining attention is the concept of assisted migration. This refers to planting tree seedlings obtained from a location that is representative of the future climate of a particular planting site. The US Forest Service has developed a web-based tool called the Seedlot Selection Tool, you can Google that and find it, that allows you to enter your location and see the current locations that are representative of the future climate of your site. You can then look for tree nurseries in, the, in those locations. Uh, my organization is involved with a couple different assisted migration projects. One higher elevation project at the Nisqually Community Forest uh, near Ashford, Washington, up around 3,000, 4,000 feet in the uh, Cascade uh, foothills. Uh, and another, the Stossel Creek project near Duval, Washington, a little bit lower elevation. And you can read about the latter project on our website. Uh, we're in the third year now of monitoring at Stossel Creek of a wide range of tree seedlings that we obtain from various nurseries in Southern Cal uh, Oregon and uh, Northern California. So moving ahead with stand development now, the stand that we planted originally um, at 400 trees per acre now is 15 to 25 years old. And it's in that classic stem exclusion phase. Trees are competing with each other for sunlight, for soil moisture. Um, now, the, the silvicultural practice at this point is something called pre-commercial thinning. Um, we are cutting trees that are too small to have any commercial value. That's why it's called pre-commercial thinning. And the point of this uh, is to accelerate the self-thinning process uh, as well as to adjust the species on the site. So the whole goal is to skip over the competitive exclusion phase and accelerate growth of the individual trees. Uh, by doing this, we can also improve timber value by maintaining optimal growth of the most dominant and or preferred species. And again, adjust the species so they're appropriate for the site, cutting out, say, on droughty soils, the, the less drought tolerant uh, species. Again, to show that graphically now, we've gone from 400 trees per acre. <clears throat> we've removed an, in pre-commercial thinning about 40, maybe 50% of the trees and dropped the stocking density down to around 240 trees per acre. Now, even though we're working with a very, very young stand, there are some things that we can do to begin weaving in some structures uh, for wildlife and begin di uh, diversifying uh, the, the structure of this stand. Uh, one of them is taking <clears throat> some of the cut poles and making constructed down logs. 
like I mentioned in many third, fourth generation forests, the old growth logs that used to occupy primary forests are long gone. We can, to a certain degree, emulate the habitat functions of these big down logs by creating constructed logs using smaller diameter poles. Uh, in the back of this picture is something called a wildlife habitat pile. By stacking uh, poles and throwing brush on top, we can also create a unique habitat structure uh, for small mammals and small birds. So this stand now has grown another 15, 10, 15 years or so, maybe 20 years. <clears throat> still a young stand, 30, 40 years old, still in the stem exclusion phase or the competitive exclusion phase, still a lot of competition between these trees. Uh, now at this age, uh, we can get into our first commercial thing. This is the first time that we're gonna begin generating some revenue from the stand. So the purpose of thinning now, and we oftentimes refer to this first commercial thinning as thinning from below, is to continue to accelerate the self-thinning process by further reducing stocking densities and favoring, again, the most dominant trees that are suitable for the site. Uh, like I said, this is best usually done commercially uh, with appropriate equipment for the site. Um, and depending on markets at the time, you know, we can generate anywhere from around $500 to $750 uh, per acre. Under today's markets, we're a little bit at the higher end of that, about $750 per acre of net revenue back to the landowner. Um, so to graphically describe thinning from below, uh, pulling this image back up again, this means that we are primarily targeting the suppressed and the intermediate trees, and to a lesser degree, some of the co-dominant trees to get the spacing just right. Uh, so in essence, again, what we're continuing to do uh, is follow the natural process of self-thinning. Uh, leaving the most of the co-dominant trees in the dominant trees in that stand uh, to continue to produce older forest conditions. Uh, we'll be taking out about a third of the trees now at this thinning, dropping it from 240 trees per acre down to about 180 trees per acre. Um, some things that we can do to begin or continue to increase uh, habitat functions, uh, we can uh, conserve snags if they occur in the stand. We can create snags by taking the equipment, reaching up uh, and cutting trees at 20, 30 feet as high as the equipment can reach and leaving them to decay on site. We can protect the old growth stumps that may occur in these stands by buffering them. If there are old growth logs still on the floor, we avoid them uh, with our equipment, work around them. We also can retain, if they exist, uh, hardwoods within the stand. Uh, biologists have found that uh, with an increase in hardwoods and conifer dominated stands, uh, we also get an increase in bird diversity. Uh, another neat trick that we use when we're logging uh, is our skitter takes the slash uh, from the landing where the logs are being processed, the trees are being processed as logs, takes that slash back out with them and distributes it on the skid trails. This minimizes compression, uh, compaction of the soils gets that organic matter spread back out in the forest where it can decay. And at times also we will leave clumps of slash to create uh, wildlife habitat piles. All right, so this stand has grown now uh, another uh, 15, maybe 20 years or so, or about 50, 60 years old. Still compared to the long-term carrying capacity of the site, we consider this, this stand to still be in the stem exclusion phase. Like I mentioned, this can happen for uh, decades. But now we're gonna get into a different thinning regime that we call variable density thinning. Uh, this thinning again further accelerates the self-thinning process, but now we begin creating more heterogeneous composition, both species and stocking. Uh, this kind of thinning can generate uh, $1,000, $1,500 of net revenue uh, back to the landowner per acre. And from a graphic representation standpoint, you have the prior treatment, uh, you know, it's still a relatively highly stocked stand in the upper left. If you look at the image in the lower right, a very heterogeneous distribution of trees. We'll leave some areas at a higher density, thin some areas um, to a lower density, uh, maybe leave some areas completely unthinned, maybe even start creating some gaps in there. This is rever referred to again as variable density thinning. Uh, on average, still, we're taking out around a third of the trees per acre, uh, dropping from 180 trees per acre down to 120 trees per acre. Um, 
And uh, we may start creating uh, some gaps in the forest, uh, thinning to a little higher density or taking out all trees uh, in an area. One thing we found in our work at the Nisqually Community Forest is that by opening the canopy like this, we get an increase in snow accumulation uh, in the understory, which helps retain soil moisture uh, in the uh, watershed, higher up in the watershed. So finally getting to an older stand, uh, 60, 80 years old, this is gonna be our second uh, variable density thin. Again, uh, continuing to work on spatial composition, uh, continuing to tease out more gaps, leaving areas of higher density, uh, this uh, third thinning can generate $2,000, $3,000 an acre. And as you can see, each time we're coming in thinning, we're uh, harvesting a higher and higher value timber products uh, out of this stand. Again, taking out on average about a third of the trees, dropping it down to about 80 trees per acre. Uh, we may at this point, and this might also occur at one of our prior thinnings, uh, start punching in some bigger gaps, you know, an acre, two acre, three acres, depending on the size of the stand that we come back into and replant to get a new cohort of trees going. This can increase the, uh, the log, or the uh, timber uh, revenue coming out of the harvest and create more uh, horizontal spatial heterogeneity that's important for biodiversity uh, in a forest. Back to uh, the Nisqually Community Forest, we've punched in just this past fall, uh, several one to two acre gaps. And we are currently doing a snow study up there looking at snow accumulation rates and the difference between snow accumulation and gaps and snow accumulation in the understory. And already we found that there's about a 40% increase in snow accumulation in these gaps, in these small clear cuts. Uh, that again should translate to retaining uh, moisture higher in the watershed later into the spring uh, season. So we may now be getting to our final harvest of the initial cohort of trees. Um, we oftentimes refer to this last harvest as variable retention harvesting because we will decide now how many trees do we want to retain indefinitely as our long-term legacy trees. Uh, this final harvest, depending on uh, the, the uh, timber value, can generate anywhere from $3,000 to $6,000 of net value per acre back to uh, the landowner. Uh, this now finally, again, taking about a third of the trees, gets us to that uh, final stocking density um, of around 50 trees per acre. But backing up to this image, look at all of the understory regeneration in here. Uh, so through the successive thinning that we have done over the past 30, 40, 50 years or so, two things happen. That sort of consistent disturbance by logging uh, exposes an, an ex, uh, a, a mineral soil that acts as a seedbed and will get a lot of natural regeneration uh, in the understory. Tends to favor more shade tolerant trees. And that's one of the reasons that we'll thin to different densities. We open the canopy a little more, create gaps, we create opportunities uh, for trees that uh, require more shade, such as Douglas fir. Um, if we're not getting sufficient natural regeneration, we may come in uh, and manually underplant. So by the time we get to this final thinning, um, uh, the next entry after this will begin working with that next cohort of trees uh, in the understory. And generally speaking, this thinning process starts all over again. And I wanna conclude with a picture of uh, Mon Pai Hansen. Unfortunately, uh, Pai Hansen is no longer with us anymore. Uh, up until 94 years of age, he was working in my family's uh, tree farms, uh, tending the baby seedlings out there. And people always asked him, hey, what's your, your key to long life? And he said, just don't sit down for too long. So if that's a take home message, uh, or if there's not a, if that isn't a take home message, I don't know what is. So I'm gonna leave it at that and turn it over to our moderators. Um, I thank you for your attention. Uh, if there is time, I have uh, a five minute video about our work up in the Nisqually Community Forest that wraps us all together. Happy to share that. Or if you guys like, you can put that link in the chat box and folks can look at that on their own. So whatever you think. Great. Thank you, Kirk. Um, I'm tempted to watch the video, to be honest, if we could make it work.
All right. Well, that's agreement. Let's see if I can pull it over. Yeah, all right. If we can make it work. Let's see what happens here. We'll give it a we'll give it one shot. Yeah, I hear you. Um and if not, we will we can post a link from our website so folks can follow up later. Sounds too. good. Well, let me see if I can find it now. What do they do with it here? <laughs> okay, here we go. And all right, do you have it on your screen? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. No audio though. Might have to turn it up. No audio, huh? Just barely any. Oh, just go to the yeah, right on. There you go. No, still can't hear it very well. <laughs> so why don't we'll just send out a link to it, Kirk? We we still can't hear it very well. Okay. Yep, right. I'm not sure how that works with with Zoom, but yep, that's all right, um, no problem. Okay, well, thanks anyway, guys. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you, Kirk. Everybody, uh, round of applause just in advance. We'll get to some questions here, but that was really a great presentation. So much, uh, so much information to take in. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Let's see, let's see what kind of questions came, and if anybody out there is still um still has questions you can you, you still have time to throw some more in the chat box so uh they, they tend to flow in at this point in time so um evan do you want to start with one sure my chat I don't, I don't know if it's my screen or not, but it seems like Evan froze for a second. Are you back with us? Yeah, sorry about that. It completely shut down. My chat box froze and then it all closed out, but brought it back. All right, sorry. Uh, why don't you start, Trevor, while I bring the chat box back up? Yeah. Um, Jacqueline asks, um, and you might have to try to kind of put yourself back in into a point of your presentation to to place the question but uh why why don't you just plant fewer trees per acre in the first place well one big reason is uh we planted a higher density expecting mortality um so mortality could be naturally well most of it's naturally induced but yeah uh we're seeing a lot of seedling mortality due to drought uh over the, the past several years. Uh, mortality could come from deer browse, uh, could come from brush competition. So one of the reasons to plant at a high density is to try to rapidly colonize a site uh, to try to overcome some of the other natural competing uh, factors such as uh, uh, brush uh, competition. Um, and so usually when we plant at a high density, you know, I get 400 trees per acre, um, you know, there on, on many sites will be sufficient mortality that we may not even need to pre-commercially thin. You know, it's kind of a rare, sometimes a rare circumstance that enough seedlings survive that you even have to do the pre-commercial thinning. So it's really kind of hedging our bets that uh, those seedlings will survive so we can use them for something in, in the future. I always say it's a lot less expensive to plant more trees than it is to come back and plant a second time. So some of the forest owners I work with planted extremely high densities, you know, 600 trees per acre, because uh, it's also less expensive to come in and pre-commercially thin uh, than to come and try to plant again, especially when you're planting into uh, some uh, brush, a brush layer that's had you know, five plus years to develop. Yeah, and I, I would just say that we kind of employ the same tactic at some of our restoration sites where we we plant a pretty high diverse, uh, high density and high diversity of species, expecting um, things to sort of settle out into natural mortality. So, yeah, certainly a tactic we use as well. So it makes sense. Uh, Evan, did you have one? Yep. So uh, Fran asks, uh, what is the impact on soil compaction, hydrology of multiple entries for thinning? That's a good question. Um, 
Not a lot of studies of, of multiple entry thinnings uh, like that. So what we're doing is trying to use strategies to minimize a uh, ground compaction. Uh, like I mentioned, distributing uh, the logging slash on logging trails, uh, keeping the equipment to dedicated skid trails so it's not running all over in the forest. Uh, so I'd say that there's a lot of operational strategies that we use uh, to minimize soil disturbance and soil compaction. Right. Okay. And uh, Jackie had asked another question, but I think you kind of covered it in that last answer. So I'm going to jump to another one that she had, which was, um, what does thinning do to, to mycorrhizal networks in forests? Yeah, again, a, a, the area that's just being, beginning to be studied right now, uh, Suzanne Simmer is one of my heroes. Uh, if you're not familiar with her, she just somewhat recently published a book called Finding the Mother Tree that's all about the mycorrhizal networks in forest soils. Um, again, I think what we have to say, what I, what I would have to say is if we want to continue to extract timber uh, products from our forests, we're going to have to tolerate a certain amount of disturbance. Uh, what we can do again, though, is operationally minimize to the extent possible uh, the dis disturbance of soils. And minimizing disturbance of soils you know, directly translates to minimizing disturbance to those mycorrhizal networks. I mentioned that we buffer uh, what we started to call mother stumps using Suzanne Simard's uh, vernacular. She refers to mother trees. Uh, it's kind of trying to take a, a Hippocratic approach to uh, to management, assuming that these old growth stumps are refugia for mycorrhizae, for bacteria, for microbes, uh, rather than you know, you know bumping them out of the way or being uh, ignoring them, we're buffering those, buffering old down logs, uh, leaving areas of the forest uh, unthinned so they can continue to be uh, vectors for mycorrhizae and other uh, forest biota to continue to move back out and colonize disturbed sites. Um, you know, you, you have to tolerate uh, a certain amount of disturbance and impact if you're going to continue to, you know, extract timber. Yep. So, uh, yep, want to thank Jennifer Beath for, uh, she posted a link to the uh, Forest Service Office of Sustainability and Climate, uh, their recent publication for Timber Harvest and Carbon. Um, and we're, we're actually in the process of reaching out to those authors to see if they could uh, present at a future meeting as well. Uh, to get a little more info on on timber harvest and and the carbon picture, which is as Kirk mentioned, is is kind of the the topic right now with with carbon sequestration. Um, so then I'll move down to Mike's uh, question, or just kind of ask him here. Uh, could Kirk briefly speak to the small landowner funding opportunities that he spoke about last night at his fireside chat? Yeah, you bet. So. <clears throat> Assuming all of you are, are in Oregon, um, there are a number of uh, federal funding programs that are specifically for non-industrial uh, private forest landowners, uh, rural landowners, uh, could be, could be uh, farmers as well, not just limited to, uh, to forest owners, uh, that help uh, offset the cost of a broad range of uh, forest restoration activities, such as pre-commercial thinning, uh, tree, plant, uh, tree planting and understock sites, uh, enhancing wildlife habitat. Uh, all of these programs are housed within the USDA and specifically the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, and two of the programs are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and the Conservation Stewardship Program. So if you're a private small woodland owner, and that can include a land trust, uh, family forest, uh, tribe, um, any number of other entities, you qualify for funding. So if you have a forest that is in a degraded condition, uh, you don't have to shoulder all the cost of restoration. Essentially, there's public funding that will help pay to restore uh, ecological values as well as timber values uh, in your forest. So if you want to know more about this, uh, feel free to email me or give me a call and I can talk to you about it. Uh, there's some nuances to them that I can't take the time to, to go into right now. But, uh, and there's a lot of other funding programs. I know through ODF um, and, uh, and elsewhere. So we live in fortunately at a time when there really is no financial reason to, to not you know, optimally care for your, your land. There's a lot of support out there.
Good to know. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. Uh, so a um, few more here. One, Fran asks about, uh, do you know about the importance of fog drip on coastal forests and how is this expected to change with climate change? Uh, I am aware of it, but no, I don't know how it's expected to change. I have not looked into that. Fair enough. All right, I think one of the last ones here, we might wrap it up, or we're probably not gonna get to everyone's questions because we're um, running into the evening here, but um, can you talk about canopy? Oh, that's my dog. Can you talk about canopy and connectivity at the landscape scale? Canopy connectivity at the landscape scale. So I think I think what Paul's referring to is um, you know like kind of old growth like kind of the patchiness of old growth forests and and okay. you know species okay. maybe like flying squirrels and and those kind of things that need kind of long you know connections between these old growth forests and that sure. kind of idea. Yeah, it might be, but maybe one of the things he's referring to is is habitat corridors, kind of a similar similar concept uh, that yeah some species. Uh, require connectivity uh, between specific um, uh, forest habitat structures. So, uh, you know, be it the, uh, the the flying squirrel or even arguably uh, spotted owl, marbled murrelet, um, are dependent on uh, on these older forest structures. You know, having well, I mean, it keeps using the same word con connectivity. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to, to state in here also is, is somewhat of a, a caveat is uh, old growth forests <clears throat> are not a, there's not a static definition of an old growth forest. It really is a, a landscape level definition. And an old growth forest ecosystem includes young regenerating forests uh, and you know, older multi you know, century old forests and everything in between that whole natural succession process. So I don't want anybody to think that I've just defined an old growth forest as solely being comprised of older trees. Uh, remember that within old growth forests, there are disturbance regimes, could be disease, could be um, uh, windstorms, what have you, that create younger naturally regenerating forests. And we need forests uh, across all of those age classes, what we call serial stages. Um, my argument is, is that our, our landscape now is dominated by younger forests and we really have a lack of these older forests. And that's why it's, it's kind of my push, my organization's push uh, to try to bring back more older forest structure and more older forest uh, functions within younger forests while sustainably harvesting timber uh, the whole way along. Great. Well, uh, anything else, Trevor? Oh, I wrote down a few questions, but I think uh, I'll, I'll say them. <laughs> Give a follow up because uh, yeah, this is this is a lot of great information. Really, uh, you know, gets gets the juice flowing for me at least. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kirk, and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. And um, thank you everybody for for spending your evening here with us at, at our uh, March meeting and. Um, I guess it's dark now. I was going to say go outside and have fun, but it's dark. So uh, everybody have a good night and uh, we'll take a quick break here. Right. Let Kirk get out of here and uh, come back for our board meeting in a couple minutes here. Thanks, okay. Kirk. Thank you again for the opportunity. You bet. Absolutely. Good night, everybody. Have yeah. a good night. Yep.